Let's get a little weird. Let's get a little odd. Those sounds you like to hear. We got it going on. It's the odd cast. It's the odd cast. It's the odd cast. It's the odd cast. Hello. 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 How is everyone doing today, tonight, this morning, this evening, this afternoon? Whenever you're watching, shout out to you and yours. Thank you for tuning in again to the Oddcast, where stuff that's odd gets the nod. We have a very special guest this episode, my longtime cousin, all my life, I think, Andy Rabins. Andy, what's up? Not much. Good to be here on the show. Good to be here in San Diego. Thanks for having me. All right. So Andy is residing in D.C. Currently, he works for the U.S. State Department. Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do at the State Department? Sure. Well, the uh, U.S. State Department is our... Uh, foreign ministry equivalent. Um, this is kind of the. Uh, uh, this is where a lot of our foreign policy gets made. Mm -hmm. It's part of the uh, uh, the executive branch of the government. Um, I do. I run our, our global youth engagement efforts. So kind of helping our, our U.S. government better connect with young people, uh, 16 to 35 year old crowds of young politicians, young entrepreneurs, young political leaders in all different pockets of the globe. So we do a lot of work with embassies and consulates to, to help meet with young people, understand the issues they care about, and mm -hmm. then kind of where those overlapping interests are between young people abroad in the United States and U.S. counterparts uh, here at home. Interesting, interesting. And I mean, I think you, we were talking a bit before, uh, you were saying that there's basically, you know, three main areas that you want to address within the program. Uh, yeah. Can you take us through that? Yeah, I mean, there are kind of three big buckets of issues that we're focused on um, in a lot of our, our youth engagement efforts. Um, one, one is this area of youth and economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the numbers of where jobs are are, uh, are going, uh, there's some pretty striking stuff there. Kind of, the, the, there's some studies that say that by 2030, in a mere 12 years, up to 40% of jobs globally are gonna disappear in some form. So- 40%? Yeah, huge, huge number. So when you think about uh, technology and artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, machine learning, um, so kind of are young people being prepared with the, the tools and education necessary to succeed in 21st century global economy, both in the United States, but also overseas. That's kind of one big bucket. Two okay. is this area of uh, violent extremism. Why is it that young people are feeling drawn in pockets of the world and in pockets of the United States to some extremist organizations, whether it's kind of your ISIL in the Middle East or if it's your Al-Shabaab or Boko Haram in, Iraq, in, uh, in, Africa. in Africa, or if it's your narco gangs in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, if it's uh, gangs in the United States or kind of extremist groups. You know, we had the, uh, the horrible attacks uh, in, uh, in, in the Pittsburgh synagogue just a day or two ago. Yeah. Um, we had some hate crimes last week. We had the pipe bombs. I mean, we're at a point right now where uh, I, I think extremism is unfortunately alive and well, and we gotta make sure that young people are moving down a more positive pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third big bucket of, area of issues that I think is the most exciting at this particular point mm -hmm. in time is this area of, uh, of youth and political participation. Why is it that uh, young people feel like they uh, they like politics, they want to be involved, but kind of have an aversion to uh, to really mixing it up uh, or getting into the arena. Throwing the politics. hat in the ring, so to speak. Exactly. So, kind of the uh, why is it that uh, that young people are are uh, are nervous about actually running for office themselves mm. um, or holding government officials accountable as leaders of NGOs, um, but recognizing that you have to have both your outside game of kind of holding people accountable and affecting things on the outside, but also your inside game of actually being willing to run for office and mix it up inside Work into kind the of system. Exactly. Move things, move things Interesting. forward from inside the system. And have you, I mean, in that third, just to address that third bucket that you were saying, um, have you seen, you know, positive feedback overseas in regards to young people getting involved in politics? Because I know that's something that we were discussing that's happening domestically. Yeah, no, I think it's, they're good signs. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the the trend lines are moving in the positive direction, uh -huh. but kind of the numbers that we currently have are, are, are pretty dismal. Um, I don't know if you know, but the the average age of a member of parliament globally today, it's about kind of 30, you have to be around 30 to be able to run for parliament, mm -hmm. you know, our equivalent of the House and, and Senate. Yeah. Uh, globally though, the average age 
about 55 years old. Mm. So in the U.S. What is it in America? Yeah, in the U.S., I mean, our, our members of the House of Representatives, 25 to run, average age 57. Wow. Senate, 30 to run, 61, 60, average age. Wow. And I mean, both of our presidential candidates in the last election were over 70. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's the interesting thing, too, because everybody also thinks that, you know, and they also were the two... Uh, even Bernie's over 70. Even when you think about the primaries and last, the, the kind of 2016 election, the oldest candidates in the race, Bernie and uh, Trump. President Trump, uh, ended up mobilizing the, the youth voice and vote uh, <laughs> in kind of the, uh, in, in the largest numbers. Even though you had younger candidates, you had Marco Rubio, I think who was the youngest on the Republican side. You had yeah. Martin O'Malley, if you remember on the Democratic side. Yeah. They, they kind of, they weren't able to uh, to connect with young people in the same way that I think some of the older candidates were. So it's also important to remember that just because you're young doesn't mean you're going to be able to connect. It's kind of what your vision of the future is. Yeah. And can you are you going to be a champion for issues that young people really care about? That's 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 interesting. And I mean, how, that 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 has to be interesting to see overseas, because I mean, I, I'm sure that I don't even understand half the issues going on in America, but I'm sure there's crazy issues going on overseas that you have to navigate as being part of the foreign service when you're when you're kind of looking at people to run for office and to encourage people to run for office so that must be pretty interesting yeah it's interesting it's also challenging because you can't we, we don't pick winners and losers we can't kind of you know uh we're we're, we're providing uh some skills trainings and chances for people to develop uh their their voice or their uh, uh their abilities to be able to uh, to advocate for issues that they care about. We don't tell them kind of what to do. So kind of the, uh, uh, there's a lot of work around trying to unlock young people's voice so that they can better advocate uh, for issues that they really care about with the hope that eventually they're gonna actually also uh, think about throwing their hat in the arena or getting involved in the political process in a bigger way. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. I mean, I also, I mean, I think we were also talking about this earlier. I think it's, it's very in, in important kind of to go overseas and get a perspective that we're kind of all fairly similar when it comes down to brass tacks. I mean, yeah, we look different, you know, we might have different gods or beliefs or political systems, but we're all human beings in the end of the day. And I mean, do you have any stories from your time overseas where you kind of like realized that, uh, you know, it was an eye-opening experience for you? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, the, uh, there are a lot of misperceptions I think all of us kind of carry with of us about, about other people who we don't know as well. And I think especially when you read news today, you know, if it bleeds, it leads still applies. And I think we kind of have these negative connotations about parts of the world like the Middle East or maybe uh, uh, across the border here in, in, in San Diego. Uh -huh. and, and I think it, it takes kind of traveling and meeting people and breaking down some of those barriers to actually uh, see people as people and realize that the aspirations that I think anyone has um, are, are very similar at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, aspirations for a, a kind of for an opportunity to make the most of your talents, for a sense of, of fairness and justice and uh, a, a edu decent education, uh, kind of decent uh, baseline level of, of, of health care and the ability to to uh, to kind of make the most of your of your your talents and. Uh, aspirations. Uh -huh. um, so I think the uh, there's American philosopher um, John Rawls. I don't know if, uh, if if you're if you're familiar with. You kind of I know the name. I'm not too familiar. Yeah. He was uh, uh, he talked about this idea of kind of the lottery of birth, uh -huh. um, not determining one's prospects in life. So kind of the idea that uh, regardless of where you're born, if you happen to be born in California, or if you happen to be born in uh, Syria, in Syria, exactly, or Iraq, uh, that. You kind of whether you're born into a rich or poor family, whether you're born black, white, brown, uh, whatever religion that might be, that the op it kind of opportunities to make the most of your uh, of your passions and talents would be uh, pretty equal, regardless of where you happen to be born in the lottery of birth. Yeah. So kind of that idea, and then you kind of play it out into different spaces, and. Uh, and you can see uh, how that could be a pretty mobilizing uh, view of, of, of the world. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me this interesting story about uh, you know some fellows you met in Syria asking you about what, what was that story? Uh, well, I met when I was in a, was for, a for me, you know, kind of the uh, 
my first time living in, in, in the Middle East was in uh, was in Jordan. Jordan, excuse um, me. In, in when I was there for for, for, for my first uh, first time living living overseas for, for State Department work, um, I ended up becoming real close with this, this group of uh, young Jordanians and kind of led by this guy Mohammed. Uh, they were at the at the time um, at the University of Jordan in Amman, and we became close friends. Mohammed and his friend Thar and a couple of other Suleiman, and uh, during Ramadan, uh, which is uh, Lasts about a month. Mm-hmm. Um, they invited me to uh, Mohammed's house for a, for a, a break fast called Sundown a, Feast. A Sunday, exactly called called the uh, uh, called a, a Monsif meal, a traditional Monsif meal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and on the way, it was in this place called Zarka, where Mohammed was from. And for me, Zarka, uh, I associate Zarka with Ayman al Zarqawi and kind of the he was mm-hmm. a, a, a one of a, kind of a famous terrorist from 9 11 and. Uh, Zarqawi, Zarka had kind of a, a slightly checkered uh, connotation. connotation from kind of reading about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was a little nervous going over there. And, and, and on the way to, uh, to to Zarka in the car, <laughs> Mohammed and Thar turn and, and, and say, hey, uh, Andy, we, we, we got something kind of personal to ask you. And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, and they say, hey, uh, uh, you're from you're from Washington, D.C., right? And, and I, uh, I say, yes. I'm kind of curious where this is going. Um, and he, they say, uh, hey, we're not trying to be too personal, but uh, DC's a pretty dangerous place, isn't it? <laughs> so you're in the middle of Jordan and they're asking you if DC is dangerous. And, and it, it, it puts it in perspective. Your point. It, you know, the kind of the, the, my nervousness, of course, evaporated very Alleviated quickly. Alleviated very quickly. But they're, they're right in the sense that kind of, you know, for an outsider, DC does seem like a very dangerous place. There's guns, there's violence in pockets. Uh, you know, kind of, when, if you just read the news about what's happening in Washington, it's not, you know, the the, the good stuff doesn't <laughs> often make the front page. It's kind of the, the negative stuff that, that's there. So I think it to, it's it's kind of hit home that I think we all come with these misperceptions and actually traveling and meeting people and breaking down some of those, uh, those barriers is kind of what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, you realize, I guess, I mean, not to sound too corny, but you realize we're all not so different at all, you know? Totally, and totally. I mean, I, you were also telling me an interesting story about uh, a female that you met in uh, Paris, I believe, who's from Northern Africa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I think that, I think also there, there is a, one of the, the kind of more memorable, I think, trips for me was was going to uh, to, to France, which seems like a, I've traveled <laughs> all over the globe. I've been to, you know, Syria and all over the Middle East and Africa and Latin America and uh, Ciudad Juarez and, uh, and for me, kind of going to France and just even to Paris and, and seeing uh, some of the discrimination that actually is there um, opened my eyes to kind of the reality of, of a lot of the challenges that we also face here at home. Um, mm. I had, when we were there, I met a, a girl named Nadara who is this dynamite uh, young female lawyer. Uh, her dad, I think, was from Cameroon, I believe. Her mom may be Moroccan. Uh, she was Muslim, African. Uh, uh, dynamic uh, lawyer, and she lived in this area called Cliche Sabois. Cliche Sabois. And it was the epicenter of a lot of the social justice uh, protests in France um, a, a number of years back. So, kind of, it had a, had a it was a known uh, city just outside of the main periphery of, of, of Paris called the, the suburbs uh, or the banlieues, uh, <laughs> as, it, as it's often referred to. Um, in Nadero, we met in Paris at, at, at an embassy event, uh, at a training, and she offered, she said, hey, uh, if you want to kind of see things firsthand, come come with me and, and I'll Cliche host you in Cliché Savoie. So the, the next day, I actually spent the day with her and her fiancé and her sister just kind of walking around the neighborhood, and she really pointed a lot of things out. She raised the idea that kind of... Uh, the challenges that exist for employment for people coming from this area uh, mm-hmm. that if they uh, put the zip code on a job application or if they put a picture of themselves or a picture is available on the internet or if their last name happens to be a, a Muslim or uh, kind of a, a Northern African yeah. uh, or Middle Eastern last name that they were discriminated against in real mm-hmm. ways and I came back from that trip kind of looking I think you know there's that saying that sometimes you have to kind of uh, what is it Sometimes the the fish doesn't realize it's in water until you take it out or something like that. Whatever the, uh, but kind I think of shed light on what's happening here. Yeah, way. I feel like I learned more about the challenges that I think are being faced in in, in the U.S. That all all of the the, the same things that Nadra was was 
advocating for abroad were also things that I think people are advocating actively for here at home. And the fact that kind of the interconnectedness of, of, of the fight and the challenges and even though Nadara, uh, you know, kind of in a different part of, 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 of the globe is uh, maybe from a very different background, um, that she's fighting for very similar things of justice and Absolutely. inclusion and equality of opportunity that I think so many Americans and global uh, youth leaders um, are fighting for around the world. And I think to me that kind of also, to your earlier point, I think made the connection about how we're all interlinked and kind of yeah. shared, uh, share similar aspirations about what the future should look like. I definitely think that's something we take for granted every once in a while is that we all are so similar and we can learn so much from each other and our, I mean, you know, our own experiences. It's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. And there has to be a ton of that within what you're doing for work. I mean, that that, that has to be pretty darn interesting. Yeah, no, there, there is. I mean, it's funny too, because the, uh, uh, when you think about like uh, shared aspirations, but also shared fears, mm -hmm. the number one, uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but mm -hmm. kind of the number one fear of people, regardless of religion, ethnicity, background, geography, Number one fear of people around the world, public speaking. Wow. Number two, debt. So kind of the number idea- Number three, taxes. <laughs> number three, taxes, spiders, yeah. snakes, everything else. Exactly. Uh, so when you think about that, you know, kind of the fact that a lot of the work that we're doing, um, both at the State Department and I think even domestically, is about trying to help young people to unlock their voice feel empowered of, exactly feel empowered to advocate and to fight for issues that uh mean something to them first find out kind of what are those issues that make them angry or light them up uh -huh. and then how do you tra channel that anger and uh excitement or energy into a more positive fashion i think kind of opening up those that comfort level to be able to speak out either online or offline is something that's really uh, yeah. really meaningful. That's interesting. I mean, I this is something I I I am I get anxiety, I get, you know, sad every once in a while, I can't sleep, whatever. But public speaking has never been one that's personally actually uh, been a challenge for me. I don't know yeah. why. No, you've always um, been able to be comfortable with that. Yeah, I don't know why. Um but this is this is something I'm I mean cuz you you definitely gone through your trials and tribulations in terms of gaining confidence for public public speaking, and you went from basically being, you know, scared shitless of it yeah. to speaking at the UN General Assembly. Yeah, that's right, the UN General Assembly, and as well as a plethora of you know events that you've hosted uh, for the State Department. So I mean, talk us a little bit through like, you know, your your trials and tribulations with that. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm no different than anybody else. I think the uh, number one fear. For sure, it was public speaking for me. I, I I had a pretty. I don't know if you remember. It was probably this is a, probably a little bit before uh, you were walking and talking and and, and, and uh, it, definitely before the uh, the, the odd cast was started. But the, uh, <laughs> growing up, I had a pretty severe lisp, and I couldn't old, say oh wats oh wats. I couldn't yeah. say shs. I couldn't say ss rs. And the the worst letter combination was the dr, the the, the drus sound. And my parents. Susan and Richard uh, love him to death, but they uh, unfortunately named me Andrew with the with the, <laughs> with the with the DR front and center. So growing up, when I tried to say my own name, it would come out uh, Andu because I couldn't say the the, the the dress out. So I would get teased constantly as a kid. Pink Panther, Snaggle Tooth. Gosh. I also had a big crooked tooth, which didn't help. Uh, Donald Duck, uh, a whole plethora of, 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 of different names mm -hmm. in, in, in the third grade I got so sick of not being able to uh, say my name when you go around and introduce yourself and I'd freeze up constantly and it would constantly come out and do that I actually changed it from Andrew to Andy which was much easier for me to say at the time and kind of that's where I it's, see it's it's really been um, ever since so I think the uh, uh, for me I mean I still uh, to this day have a bit of a chip on my shoulder about mm -hmm. uh, public speaking and, and, and feeling like um, that I have something that's important to say and and that you can articulate that. and I can articulate exactly get yeah. figure a way to get those words out and, and, and make a point um, in in that kind of to be able to uh, <clears throat> to do that um, and to be able to kind of advocate for things I really care about you have to be willing to try to articulate your points and to, and, and, and to get your voice heard in some in some fashion mm -hmm. um, so for years uh, you know I I've been uh, I've worked with a, a, a speech coach 
um, growing up or a speech therapist, I'm sorry, to kind of get over the lisp issue. And then uh, for the last uh, 10 years or so, um, I, I've been going to Toastmasters and mm-hmm. just trying to get more comfortable um, as a speaker. And it turns out that uh, public speaking is something that you can just get so much better at with practice. Um, wow. And even the, the, the best speakers, I think, of our day, whether it's President Obama or uh, Clinton, President Clinton Blair. or Tony Blair, uh, even, even President Trump, even today, Trump. I think, has, has a, a, a different style of public speaking, but is incredibly effective. Yep. All of these people, um, all of these Kamala Harris here in California, all of these people have all worked with speech coaches. And have developed their own just voice. Grinded their own. And grinded. You have kind of Clinton's famous, you know, and then they kind of add in their own. Let me be clear, you know, Obama had uh, look, Obama had his, his his ball and his basketball and yeah. uh, everybody. You, you have kind of your uh, your famous uh, and, and you add. I think you add those those pieces in. But if you if you watch President Obama when he ran against Bobby Rush in Chicago for Congress and lost, or if you see uh-huh. President Clinton when he gave the 1980. The national convention speech for the uh, DNC, Democratic National Convention, uh, they were not the same speaker as they are today. Yeah, you told me, didn't Clinton get booed off the stage? He got booed off the stage in 1980. <laughs> President Obama uh, had a really rough race against Bobby Rush when he tried to primary him in Chicago for his first congressional seat. Yeah. So I, I think kind of anyone uh, can get much, much better just by practicing, by going to kind of a a warm environment. Um, so that's like your advice. Masters. That's your advice for people: practice, practice, practice. Get into a comfortable environment, and then slowly kind of step out of your comfort zone. Yeah, step by and step. Do it in step by step. You know, I, I've tutored for a long time in Washington D.C. for mm-hmm. uh, for for fifth and sixth graders, and I feel like even tutoring and getting in front of uh, teaching civics or kind of getting in front of reading to to, uh, to to kids or to family or whatever that is, that just kind of helps to just. Get, get you more comfortable speaking out and mm-hmm. raising your voice and uh, just utilizing it in, 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 in ways that can be helpful. I, I'm, I'm sure even like for your podcast, yeah. I'm sure from kind yeah. of... Watch episode one compared to when you watch this one. I mean, I'm not saying I'm amazing now. It's just going to continue to grow and continue to get better. No I mean, question. Like, I, you know, interview, this is one of my first interviews. You get, you, you, you naturally kind of get a little nervous, but then you get comfortable. You start to learn the questions to ask and kind of how to... Stick and move, stick and move. You know? Absolutely. It is absolutely. what it is. Well, I mean, so to I want to tie that point in. So as you you realized basically you were going to need to public speak, but when, at what point was it, you know, because you wanted to be basically a professional tennis player from my long-term memory. Yeah. When, at what point was it, you know, got recruited to play tennis at Harvard, by the way. Um, uh, when was it, you know, that you decided, you know, I'm maybe not going to be a tennis player. I want to go into this international relations game. It's funny the for the uh, the, te- the tennis piece too. I always I always looked up to uh, growing up. Kind of Jim Courier is one of my favorite players because he had red hair and we, we had very different tennis styles. But world number one. At, at one point he was. And I remember I'd watch these tennis players win a tournament and they would give this big <laughs> speech on center court in front of everybody <laughs> and actually initially kind of I, I, I my biggest fear was that at some point I'd win one of those tournaments and then I would freeze <laughs> up and not be able to speak so kind of even even if you're going to be a professional athlete being more comfortable with your own voice um, has resonance but for That's me interesting. my first week of, of freshman year of college um, 9-11 happened I was out there early for, wow. uh, for, for tennis practice and that completely uh, changed my trajectory of course um, it, uh, it raised a lot of kind of questions about the larger world we're living in. That you didn't probably even think about before, huh? I didn't think much about kind of the, you know, I grew up in Berkeley, California, and I was, I, I kind of knew what was going on of course. domestically and a little bit globally, but, you know, uh, when 9-11 happened, it just raised so many questions and also kind of real, it made me realize, I think, my own ignorance about the larger kind of global scope. environment. Yeah, a global scope that, that, that that's out there. Uh, kind of attackers coming from Saudi Arabia and we immediately went into Afghanistan and uh, kind of Pakistan connections and Southeast Asia and mm-hmm. uh, all these other kind of issues that the idea that kind of insecurity anywhere could affect security everywhere, even at home. Interesting. Um, I ended up, uh, I was initially going to be a, a psychology major. I decided huh. to take a couple classes in uh, international affairs. They try to understand uh, the world a little better and just got lit up. Um, caught the bug. Caught the bug. 
and that's all it took. And then ended up majoring in government and international affairs and uh -huh. uh, came to Capitol Hill for a little bit and then went to grad school in London, did international relations masters. And uh, I've been fascinated by kind of the larger world ever since. And I think also kind of how do you, how do you break down some of these misperceptions? How do you build greater bridges? And how do you find ways of trying to bring people a little bit closer together? Wow, that's interesting. So I mean, even I would say even like not only public speaking, but just being able to, like you say, articulate your point in an effective manner must be an incredibly important uh, tool for you. It's, I mean, it's important, but I think you know a, a, the, a lot of the work that that's done is is like helping create a platform or uh, create opportunities for other young people who are doing incredible things and advocating for issues and uh in all different pockets of, of the world to to be able to provide uh platforms for them to be able to get their voices heard mm -hmm. uh in real ways as well so i think you know that uh, must be difficult in some certain instances i mean with social media and such it's easier now but i mean that's still giving people a voice a voice to the voiceless is a tough task yeah and i think not you know, i think it's it's more kind of you, people just don't realize the power of their own voice if uh -huh. they can just unlock that. And all of us, I think, have that, uh, we all have that kind of drive and when mm -hmm. we get in touch with kind of what makes us angry or what makes us lit up, uh, we, we can kind of get to some of that or yeah. draw that out. Or if we kind of think about where do we spend a lot of our time or what kind of moves us or what do we read first, you know, kind of then thinking about how can we actually, you know, change the world up or change things up to to make things a little bit better more equitable and then yeah. to kind of how do we understand the world as it is the world that we're currently living in but kind of not necessarily accept that world but kind of shape that world as it could be you know a more fair just inclusive equitable uh a world that would that uh, many of us i think strive for so i think that's the in unlocking our individual voices to as bobby kennedy said i think create kind of that ripple of efforts around the world that leads to that larger current of activism or change that I think we can actually accomplish if we're able to connect the dots, connect our voices to create kind of a larger chorus of uh, uh, of, of change that we want to see. Yeah. So um, let's, let's relate that kind of back to, you know, what's going on here. We got midterm elections mm. coming up in November. Um, you know, House and Senate both up for grabs theoretically. Um, I think, you know, one of the interesting things that we were discussing that relates to, you know, doing youth stuff uh, across the globe for the State Department is we're seeing an influx of youth within the midterm elections, I believe. Yeah, no, it's I think it, 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 it's midterm again, November 6th, a week from uh, a week from Tuesday. Uh, it's it's still kind of a. An, an interesting thing that the election does take place during the week on a Tuesday, <laughs> a whole other issue that I think it would, be, would be in our podcast. But it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting, and I think one of the really interesting pieces about this cycle of 2018 has been that you're seeing more first-time candidates, more millennial and youthful candidates, more minority candidates, more female candidates on all sides of the the political spectrum exactly. uh, running than ever before. So I think there's some really good signs of, 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 uh, of more, uh, more candidates actually contesting elections yep. for, I think hopefully for the future Congress to be more uh, representative and look a little more like the country as a whole. And then regardless of party, that's important. That's you important. know, regardless of left or right, we want it to be, we are a representative democracy. Absolutely. I think, I think regardless of your politics, I think people recognize the power of politics frankly to affect their day-to-day -day lives which is great you know yeah. i think instead of just kind of turning a blind eye i think people feel a sense of urgency to get their voice or their their voice heard or their vote counted urgency or and of, ownership of a vote you know ownership of yeah this is my vote this is what i want to happen in my district absolutely you know? and if i and if i don't like what's happening in my district well <clears> maybe i'll there's no reason i can't win for that seat myself at a local level uh, at a congressional level thing. so i think kind of the uh th there's a kind of an opening up of the process to some degree which do is you, really exciting do you know if it's happening on the kind of state legislature level as well yeah same it, thing it is okay it, a number i mean organizations on both sides of the or all sides frankly of the political spectrum uh, -huh. uh even there's a kind of a movement to try to get away from the the two-party structure and yeah. have something that's more uh 
a kind of more options for people to pick from. Sliding scale almost. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I think at all levels of, of elected office, whether it's kind of the your city council and your school board and your kind of your local city offices to your uh, your congressional districts to, to your, your senate races, to your port authorities, <laughs> to your your governor's races, I think you're seeing just an influx of new candidates and from a diverse city of backgrounds and yeah. experiences that's really exciting. Well, one thing I was thinking of, I mean, people, you know, whatever, we cannot deny the fact that Trump has been controversial, but do you think that him not being a career politician and basically winning the highest office in the land has helped that influx of whether it's from Republican or Democrat, it's kind of I, no, alerted I, people that they can run. Absolutely, I think you know. I I think it's uh, it's it's helped to open up the space. I think a lot of people who maybe never thought about politics themselves are saying, "Hey, you know, this guy was an entrepreneur. His kind of background was exactly. in something very different. He wasn't a career politician. He didn't get involved in this stuff from he didn't play by the he, rules at all. You know, the time he was a, a young kid, and I think it makes a lot of people look and say, "Hey." Why can't I get involved in this yeah. process in some bigger way? So I think that that's been a, a good thing. And inherently, exactly that again, irregardless of party, that is a good thing. And I mean, you know, so many people spend so much time talking about the negatives of Trump. I think that's a positive that he's really provided kind of an avenue for all kinds of people getting involved in the political process, which is inevitably going to be good. Because yeah, no, I think I think Americans are lit up in in in, in I think energized by politics in a way that we've never seen before yeah. which i think is you know there is the kind of the whole period of the arab spring where i think we were looking elsewhere for kind of where energy was mm -hmm. was being mobilized mm -hmm. and i think now with the march for our lives where a group of high school students are, are leading charges to kind of tell congress to do better yeah uh, you're seeing efforts around social justice issues yeah you're seeing mobilization around women's yeah uh empowerment uh a refusal to stand still as 19 percent of our national legislature are female uh where the u.s ranks 97th in the world in terms of 97th 97th in terms of female representation in, well, our, in name, our national legislature name one country who's just ahead of us that Saudi, would be surprising too, well, saudi arabia and kenya are ahead of us in terms of representation of women within the government 97th and i think even Dude, even even last phenomenal. week even last week well, the government of of ethiopia <laughs> just announced uh that their new cabinet uh, their new prime minister was elected and their new cabinet would be half female. Wow. And, and some of the, the, the national security positions, like the defense minister uh -huh. and the, their minister of peace, kind of a foreign affairs defense uh, position, would both be female as well. So wow. not only kind of, uh, I think there are trends in, the, in, in kind of in, in a positive direction and hopefully um, off of the midterms next week, we'll see uh, a larger influx of of women in Washington and yeah. at the local level, and I think that's going to lead to to better politics across the board. Precisely, I mean, because yeah, you know, and within the political process, we're going to weed out you know whoever, whether they're a female or male, whether they're a white, black, Hispanic, Asian, we're going to weed out people who are not you know who are disingenuous, and and we're going to get the cream of the crop. So I, yeah, that, I, absolutely. That's and I think I, w I will say though, I mean, <coughs> I do, the one thing I do worry about, and I think that that is a little bit nerve wracking, is is the fact that. I think we are also in an incredibly divisive political moment. That was going to be my next question is, you know, moving, like ideally, of course, again, regardless of party, no one wants this divisiveness, this huge gap between the left and right where we can't even sit down at the table and break bread. I mean, before, let alone negotiate serious political issues, serious policy issues, serious uh, foreign policy issues. What, I mean... Of course, yes, this youth influx moving forward, because generally younger people are going to be more open to a, a wider range of ideas. What also can we do to make it less divisive? I mean, do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great a great question. It's it's kind of like a million dollar question. It's right a loaded now. one. <laughs> it is loaded. No, it is a loaded one. But I think the uh, I think there's a big fear that uh, uh, division is a really in in in, in fear. Are, are really powerful motivators um, to get people revved up and riled up um, and, and I think give, uh, it can benefit certain politicians and groups politically as well. Yeah, I think and the I, news is playing into that the, very The heavily. news, when you look at the rate, the top ratings on, on, on news today are kind of the, it's, it's your Rachel Maddow's and your Sean Hannity's and there's, mm. you know, they're both incredibly 
effective uh, uh, communicators, but I think they, they are pushing their viewers to one side or another, and there's not a lot of, well, of, of kind of a fair uh, perception or a fair kind of... Discourse, even. Discourse of, of kind of what's happening. Uh, uh, there's maybe a little bit of demonizing well, with, uh, the other person. Exactly. With Hannity and Maddow, just as two examples on opposite ends of the spectrum, I feel like the people who watch Hannity and Maddow, no disrespect to them, they already know what they believe in, and they're just watching it almost to verify. No, I think there's a big problem. I mean, I think social media, also Facebook and, and, and other uh, platforms, are, are you kind can of, just spoon feed yourself. We're talking in, in echo chambers, and I think we 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 yeah. we're kind of we're built to to kind of move towards people or to accept uh, beliefs that that kind of work with our own. A way of thinking, well, like you said, echo chamber, echo our own. I it, mean, exactly, yeah. and I think we have to find <laughs> ways of of uh, we know. I think even from earlier discussions, but we know uh, that there's a lot more common ground that people are willing to let on. Yeah, and that a lot of the issues, you know, are, are we many of us have shared aspirations, regardless if you happen to, to vote Republican or Democrat or uh, Independent or whatever that might be. And Everyone think, wants good quality of life, good health care, and opportunities for their kids. Absolutely, you know? <laughs> a sense of fairness, justice, inclusivity of, of some sort, equality, kind of. Again, back to that John Rawls quote, you know, kind of lottery of birth, not determining your prospects in life. Yeah. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, I think the majority of politicians also want, I think almost at all politicians want the United States to succeed and for us to be a, a, a kind of a, a powerful, but also a, a, a equitable, a, a equitable, but also a useful player in terms of making the world That's a little true. more peaceful and secure and economically prosperous. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I, I think, yeah, finding kind of some of those common values and deciding to fight each other during elections are fine but then yeah. once the election ends coming back together and trying to push the country forward and then at least giving some time before the next election hits uh, when we can fight again decide if we want to take things in a new direction or continue down a, a current path yeah um, but I think today there's too much of election day ends and then already we're thinking about the next cycle and we're thinking <laughs> about how do we make sure that, that the other party uh, fails. How do we score points? And exactly, small political point scoring versus kind of the, the, putting the country first and putting <laughs> kind of our collective, uh, our collective security and prosperity ahead of, of 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 political partisanship. Yeah, no, I think you made a really interesting distinction there in that once the election cycle is over, you're all one body. You're literally Absolutely. you're one unit. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think very few people actually in this day and age really realize that fully. I mean, it's so divisive that we just think that it's red and blue just kind of coming together and not really coming to any agreement. But that's what it theoretically should Absolutely. be. Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. We're, we're here in, 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 in San Diego, obviously, and, you know, we're next to Camp Pendleton where, where kind of the Marines are and, uh -huh. and Coronado where, uh, where some of the, the, the Navy is working out of. Yep. And you think about kind of the military uh, and those folks are putting their lives on the line, uh, regardless of, of, of politics. Exactly. Kind of putting the country first. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've personally, I've been 10 years now. I just hit my 10 year, uh, mark last, uh, last week or two weeks ago at the state department. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's no, no, no watches or, uh, or big gifts, unfortunately, but the, uh, uh, but I've worked now for three presidents, uh, five secretaries of state. And, you know, kind of, I, I've gotten to see a lot of people, uh, colleagues who kind of are, are, are truly committed to trying to uh, change the world in a positive fashion. They're willing awesome. to kind of, they have their political opinions, but then once the election, uh, once the, the people the, the, the people decide kind of who they want to have in office. It's on to compromise and working. They're going to find a way, exactly. Off. If I work your tail off, put your head down and... And, and try to do the best you can to push the country forward until you then uh, a next a next election comes up and you can advocate to your heart's content to try yep. to decide if you want to continue down that path or or move somewhere else. That's a good and point. At any point, you always have the option if things get too bad to uh, to quit and to to, to resign. So Absolutely. I think um, I think the million dollar question in today's politics is how how can we bridge and refine um, and refocus some of that. That uh, uh, that bipartisan spirit, yeah, um, and bring people 
uh, it's not just a global thing. It's kind of looking domestically at how do we actually bridge some of those gaps and bring people a little closer together. Absolutely. I mean, well, because this is the one thing we were discussing earlier too is, uh, you know, this is the first time since the Civil War that the most left-leaning conservative and the most right-leaning liberal have not crossed over on any issues. Yeah, some of and the votes. That's crazy. Yeah, it stinks. It, it's, you know, I think that's something that, again, irregardless of party, we can all agree on that. The government should be working together hand in hand. And I think it's 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 there's also a distinction between I think those on a voting perspective, uh -huh. there's no overlapping kind of votes. But on a personal perspective, yeah, I think if they if we could force them to sit down and have a meal or have a brew or or uh, or talk about kind of families or their kids or uh, shared aspirations, shared aspirations, kind of their their upbringings, I, I I'm, I'm positive that we can there find crossover. common oh. ground. Not even a doubt. I mean, again, like we were saying when we were talking about what you do overseas, everyone has the same, no one wants to be hungry. No one wants to Absolutely. be, no one wants to think that if they have a goal that they can't achieve it, if they set out to do it, you know, in a proper way. Absolutely. And, and I'll say that as someone who uh, has spent a lot of time trying to bring young Israelis and Palestinians together, or young mm -hmm. Saudi Arabian youth and Iranian youth, they're kind of... Uh, groups that whose governments might not even talk to each other yeah. and seeing that after a very short time period they're gonna kind of uh, take off the armor and be able to connect on a personal level why we're not able to do that in our own backyard just because of an R or a D by your name or because <laughs> of uh, red or blue red or blue it just do doesn't quite make sense so I think there's a it's tribal it's interesting. It's the tribal nature of the, I mean, the people buy into the tribalness of it. Yeah. And we need to get away from tribalness, that. Tribalness, kind of moving into our own corners, uh, defining ourselves by, yeah, kind of our uh, tribe first rather than country first. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to try to bridge those gaps. And uh -huh. I think the, uh, the million dollar question is going to be, uh, can this new group of legislators that are going to start after the, the, the midterms, um, be effective in local that. And, 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 and national can they be effective in trying to bridge some of those divides or are we going to need more help to kind of make that happen and I think as uh, non-elected officials I think we all have a role to play in terms of trying to walk the walk and live uh, no doubt you know hear other other people's perspectives and opinions no doubt. try to get out of our of our echo chambers be willing to talk about politics at the dinner table especially with relatives who may have different views mm -hmm. uh, than your own so I think it's there's a lot that can be done uh, right away. Absolutely. Well, hey, I hope nothing but the best moving forward, as I'm sure everyone does. Um, so, yo, you were telling me this crazy story about some technology going on in Sweden. Why don't you give us a brief <laughs> rundown of that? Because this sounds like an absolute trip. Yeah. No, I should have. I should have uh, double checked what the uh, what the companies were called. But I was reading this <laughs> this uh, couple articles here a few days ago about this. Uh, it's it's a brand new. Uh, uh, it's it's a chip that you that in Sweden it's become really really popular uh, that it's it's kind of like a, a prick and, and they put this a microchip in your uh, either your your thumb or your pinky. I have the Business Insider article about it. About this, three thousand Swedish people have inserted a microchip into their bodies to make daily lives easier. Is the headline? And it's got all your passcodes, your computer passcodes. When you think about kind of all the different codes and fobs and locks and keys that you need in today's world instead of having a kind of a gigantic you know keychain with everything and constantly losing or forgetting where kind of where your passwords held it you know it's a one-stop shop that you can kind of always have that supposedly is even more secure because it's going to be on you but what about this this is the issue that a lot of people have been bringing to rise with this what happens when people learn how to hack those that's gonna biohacking. That's a fair no. That's, a fair <laughs> that's gonna be that's gonna you're be, gonna be twitching because someone in you know Detroit living in their mom's basement hacked your finger. <laughs> no, it's I, I, it's it, it is nerve wracking. Yeah, you. I mean, you may. I, I think kind of we're we're moving in that direction. I think it, it reaffirms that we really are moving kind of towards this tech being. I think the phone is already to some people kind of an extension of their hand. Of course. And I think now like you really do have tech. Kind of embedded into your into your body in real ways, so yeah. I think it's it's pretty wild to see where this is going. I'm, I'm waiting actually for the uh, uh, the new kind of uh, glasses to come out that 
would be able to ID people in a room so you can have a little bio blurb, kind of like your... And you were saying these are going to be like contact lenses. They're not even going to be those goofy Google yeah, glasses. Yeah, no, I think they're already working on some of that stuff where, you know, you throw on a, a, a pair of contact type things and you're kind of minority report style, able to look yeah. at, at people and see kind of a profile of what they're... Uh, and I think there's some really... Uh, interesting things that could come of that but also some really scary things Absolutely. in terms of uh if we can't kind of break down some of these misperceptions about each other i think that <laughs> could that could lead to some some uh uh some pretty ugly stuff um as as well well how about within that i mean within that do you feel that there's an opportunity too for I, i've thought this since i was a kid if i could come up with a microphone in the ear that would instantly translate languages like the UN translators, yeah. but if it was a computerized technology, I mean, that would, you would never have to learn another language. No question. I mean, even that, I, already on the phones today, you know, you have Google Translate. You know, you can yeah. get, you can talk to somebody anywhere in the world, and you can have a conversation. You're kind of you're able to connect even without copy and paste it into Google Translate, basically. <laughs> exactly, or even yeah. voice. It's voice recognition now, where kind of you say something, you just put your phone down, it will actually oh, kind phenomenal. of do a transcript in real time while you're talking to somebody in a different language. Wow. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're there on a lot of this stuff. And you think about also, I mean, the use of drones and uh, driverless cars and- This is one uh, I actually want to ask you about. How do you feel about, um, I mean, you work within the government, I, I know, you're not linked to NASA at all, of course, but with with the rise of kind of Musk with SpaceX and Jeff Bezos with Blue Planet, it's called. Mm -hmm. how, I mean, because we're on technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you see the in, in, the future of like private public partnerships within the space, not space race anymore, but within our uh, galactic future? I guess. No, I think I mean I think there's <laughs> some really there's some really interesting stuff. I mean, from I think the ideas for. A space force and what that means, and kind of, uh, I think, a kind of a scaling up of of efforts to explore what else is out there outside of the Earth. Um, yeah. To kind of the private sector taking a, a leading role um, to try to identify uh, other other planets, and also I think they have, in some cases too, I think kind of a uh, are looking for new resources and. Mm -hmm other other opportunities uh, in addition to just being able to travel but i think it also shows i think people's willingness to uh to embrace a larger world that we're living in yeah um and i think that's kind of a positive thing i think it, there's an interesting statistic about the number of americans who uh who have a passport today and it's still far below uh i think it's uh, kind of around 30 percent or so really an all-time high and the idea that kind of I've had a passport my whole life. I mean, that's just <laughs> that's yeah. But it's that's how I've unique. grown up. That, yeah, you know, that, that that that's not the norm. That's the abnormal. Uh, uh, I couldn't it, imagine. And, that and I think kind of trying to get more Americans to both travel and experience a larger world that we're living in. But now think about not only traveling within uh, kind of our own Earth, but the idea that a lot of people are interested. And there's a long wait list to try to travel and see a different planet is kind of Absolutely. a cool thing. Oh yeah, I mean those guys at Blue Planet, Jeff Bezos, they're talking about running like space tours by 2020. And then NASA, along with what you said about the Space Force, I did this on the last podcast episode, uh, by 2030 we're supposed to be having, you know, being running missions from a base set up outside of Moon to Mars. So 2020, 2030 is going to be pretty insane in terms of space exploration moving forward. Yeah. So, I mean... I think all this comes back though. I mean, like you were saying, it's just like the human brain is just phenomenal in terms of our capacity to like kind of keep looking to what's next, even though we're so, I mean, we're sitting here in freaking a nice computer chair, a lazy boy, we're comfortable, but we're always pushing to the next limit. And that's yeah, really awesome. Absolutely. And I think that's also, I think that's what, I think most of us too kind of want that sense of purpose and kind of, of that course. sense of, of, of making progress or kind of, uh, making the world a little bit better or closer or kind Leaving of Leaving some sort of it. footprint that you've been here and contributed. Absolutely. I mean, to like, again, make the world a better place for your kids is the corny line of it. But that's, there's, sorry, stuff is corny and cliche for a reason because it's true. Totally. I mean, I think about like the, uh, which it's, it's also kind of corny and cliche, but kind of the, the, the two models of kind of understanding the world as it is and uh -huh. kind of how things work, how government works, how private sector works, how kind of the system is currently set up, the uh, the, the, the lack of, of opportunity for some groups maybe within that, and then kind of seeing the, the world as it could be, not just as it is, but 
the worlds it could be. And then bridge that. And trying to bridge that, understanding the worlds it is, so that you can create the change and pull the, the necessary bureaucratic levers if need uh -huh. be to be able to get to that world as it could be. Well, I mean, that's why studying, I mean, that's why people study history in school still, because you learn the mistakes of your past to not recreate them in the future. Exactly. There's a exactly. 5%, there's a 5% uh, voting threshold in Germany for a reason, folks, <laughs> a, 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 a. because the Weimar party was able to take party. Exactly. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's, I mean, that's, Look, all positivity. Uh, let's let's round it off with sports. Let's talk sports real quick. Okay. So, we inevitably are going to talk World Series. It has been phenomenal. <laughs> Three games to one. Boston Red Sox are ahead of the Los Angeles Dodgers right now. Uh, you know, the Boston Red Sox outfield is nasty. I know. You see, there is a picture of... Uh... Was a Ben Attendee, I think, making this incredible catch that they they people were uh, I think in Boston were advocating for that to be a new MLB logo. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be on. The, I mean, dude, that kid is a stud. I mean, Mookie Betts, Xander Bogarts, J.D. Martinez. Uh, that guy Pierce last night had himself a game. But I mean, you know, eight an eighteen inning World Series yeah, game. I mean. Good. Come on, that's history. People were complaining. Oh, baseball's too long. You got you just got to watch history, folks. Yeah. Uh, do you see? The Red Sox taking it home. I think the Red Sox are gonna win this. I mean, the, you think uh, they win tonight? I think they're gonna win tonight. I think they've got momentum on their side. The uh, I was in uh, in in Boston actually when they when they broke the curse when uh, uh, when uh, Big Poppy and two thousand four was it? I think it was two thousand. Was two thousand four or five? Yeah, two thousand four. I think it was two thousand four, two thousand five. That was Dave Roberts, the coach of the Dodgers, was on that team. That's I heard that. That's crazy. I didn't realize he was. Uh... Dave Roberts was the guy who scored the run against the Yankees uh, when they were down three games to zero and yeah, they came back. in dramatic fashion too, of course. Yeah. The Yankee, the, the Boston Yankee, uh, Boston New York rivalry. Uh, but I think I think tonight's gonna be tonight's gonna be pretty good, and I think the uh, it's nice to see kind of. Boston back in the mix. It's it's nice to see the Dodgers, who I grew up despising the Dodgers because I was a big Oakland A's fan and they were our our, our rival. Kirk Gibson. The Kirk Gibson <laughs> Oral Hershiser years. Man. Uh, but it's good to see kind of some of these uh, these like kind historic of, rivalries. Yeah. Rekindled. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think it's fun too. I you know look. I think Machado's a dirty player, but I think it's fun seeing him get booed. I think it's fun that he doesn't care. I think it's fun that Yasiel Puig does these dances when he gets a freaking single. A lot of people complain about it, but it's it's it's, it's fun. It's like new school baseball in a way. I will say the one thing I was a little disappointed about last night though was that the uh, there are a lot a lot of characters on both teams. Oh yeah. Um, but I will say that nobody made any comments, no color commentating. <laughs> I know about the say. two gigantic red beards who were facing off against each other. He's talking about Boston's closer Clay. Kimbrell against uh, Los Angeles' third baseman, uh, Justin Turner. Yeah, no, there was nothing, kind of, nobody made any comments about it. it, was, it was, Dude, the Battle it was of the Redbeards. The I Battle mean, of the Beards. There's no way that someone, <laughs> I mean, these commentators have, you know, hours and hours to make up these BS stories about how they played summer ball with so-and-so's cousin back in the day, and they can't comment on the Battle of the Beards. Absolutely. I'm totally on board with you on that. I will say, though, just before we move off of baseball, uh -huh. I, will, I will say that kind of one of my... Uh, one of the books I, I constantly recommend for work now for kind of thinking about how do you how do you measure the effectiveness of public diplomacy and, and kind of exchanges and people to people engagement mm -hmm. is uh, is Moneyball, which is one of my my, my favorite books of all, book. of all time, Michael Lewis, and kind of the idea of, of when you think about uh, baseball uh -huh. and kind of what actually makes a player worth. A huge price tag and kind of how do you measure someone's success where well, you have batting average and you have kind On of base percentage slugging percentage exactly. wins above replacement but there's a whole lot of other data you can start crunching which people have started to do and yep. Moneyball kind of ushered in Billy Bean ushered in this whole new well he ushered that in not only in baseball I mean you talk to there's interviews with Mark Cuban about how the Mavs pulled off that insane win against LeBron James and Dwayne Wade in the heat when they were down two games to zero Analytics, huh. completely analytics. He said they switched from zone to man to man in certain situations when LeBron was on a certain quadrant of the floor. Huh. It is, I mean, you're totally right. Billy Bean ushered in a complete era of analytics within sports. I mean, and you you would think basketball it's so fluid that it's really hard to contain the analytics. Yeah, they were able to do it. Interesting, and, but I think you can even apply that to like international affairs and yeah. politics and kind of how do you measure program success and, and, and kind of are the indicators of people's perceptions of the United States or kind of people's perceptions of, the, of each other. Yeah. What are all the other 
underlying indicators in addition to that that could be measured that could kind of create some more concrete results of how things are, are, are moving forward. It's similar to even, you know, and when you watch Shark Tank, they always ask, what's your customer acquisition rate? You know, based on how much you advertise, how many customers mm. you get. It's a similar kind of thing. I mean, based on a certain type of program, have you gotten good results in terms of, you know, the participation of people of young people from that country. Yeah. You know, you want to have that tangible feedback. Yeah. I think analytics are invaluable. Totally. And politics, thinking about politics too. It's not just kind of how many how you vote in this one bill or how many bills you introduce. There are all these other factors I feel like you can totally. start crunching and measuring and actually kind of breaking people's effectiveness down in, in new ways. Totally, totally. So all right, just quickly, you're from the Bay Area originally. I gotta ask, I gotta get a quick thought. Are the Golden State Warriors gonna three peat? I I think there's there's a high high probability they're gonna three peat. I think they're they're gonna they're gonna they may four peat, they may five peat. Same roster but with Boogie Cousins. I mean, yeah, it's it's likely. In in their they've created the program, I think, under Steve Kerr. They're moving to a new beautiful stadium in downtown San Francisco next yeah. year. I think they're, they've created a, Plus a it's system. it's going to be rocking. It's going to be rocking where people want to come play for them. So I think yeah. you're going to see more talent probably in, in years to come. What if Anthony Davis goes to the Lakers? How co cool would that rivalry be? I think mean, that would be an amazing rivalry. I think that would be an amazing. I think the whole Western Conference is going to be, in, in, the playoffs are going to be incredible. Yeah, but, especially if the Rockets get Jimmy Butler. Yeah, they offered four first rounders for him. I, I don't think Melo is that great of an addition. I hate to say it. I think he made the Thunder worse last year. That's a controversial statement. Yeah, you know, all I mean, your Oklahoma viewers are not going <laughs> to appreciate that. Sorry, Cat. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so okay, Golden State, you heard it here first. They will three peat. And I'll uh, also say real quick. I'll say for for the LeBron James because where you are pretty close to, to LA. Absolutely. I think I love the fact too that. LeBron's getting all this love, as he rightfully should, for also f playing a role in, in, in some of the kind of political, social issues, his new school out in, in Akron. Insane. Uh, it, it, it's a positive development that I think is also putting pressure on other big time athletes and leaders in their respective sports to play a more active role in their communities, where they grew up, in the yeah. communities that they've adopted through their teams. And Jaylen, I think that's something that's really kind of a positive trend. Yeah, Jalen Rose actually, a phenomenal basketball player uh, uh, and pundit on ESPN now, started the Jalen Rose Leadership Academy in his hometown in uh, Detroit. Uh, and it's a very similar blueprint to what LeBron did, and he really doesn't get a ton of shout outs for it, but he really did, uh, he's one of the original people who really did one of those leadership academies that if kids graduate there, they get a full ride to a local state college, which That's great. No, is freaking I think, incredible. No, shout out to Jalen Rose. And I think it's good that this is getting a lot of coverage, and I think it's gonna put uh, kind of a, a little bit more heat on other players to, like to said, follow yeah. suit. Well, even not just players. I mean, even people who are just have big money within the community. I think that's yeah, one of the great things absolutely. about like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The it's philanthropic like, community. Yeah, really you better be doing this. that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. So, okay. So, Golden State, repeat, you heard, three Pete, you heard it here first. Maybe even a five Pete, according to this man right here. Uh, so, you played tennis. We talked about it. We got to talk about tennis real quick. I want to ask you, so... When's the changing of the guard happening? And you know what I mean. Everyone knows what I mean. Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, and Murray. When are they falling off? When does TFO, when does Zverev, when does pa uh, uh, Popperin come through? Uh, when did these guys kind of start to take the reins of the tennis scene? I mean, they, 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 it's a good question, you know. Federer's 37, 37 yeah, years old. You know, he's been around for, he's been a star for 20 years. And I think the... It's incredible to see that he can even still play a five-set match, you know, in some of these Grand Slam tournaments. His last and Wimbledon, I don't think he dropped a set. I think I think Wimbledon's a different story. But he's that's still, true. You that's know, fair. That's fair. Uh, the, guy, the guy's the LeBron James of Wimbledon. He's King 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 James of Wimbledon. Yeah, he's the Nadal, Nadal of he's Nadal at Roland Garros. Absolutely. I mean, but uh, but I, I think you know I think he's got I think he may he and Nadal certainly are going to be the favorites. At, respectively at, at Wimbledon for Federer and, and Roland Garros this year for, for Nadal. Uh -huh. um, I think TFO is... Uh, Francis TFO, guys. Up and coming. Is going to be an up and comer, for sure. But I will say I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that there are no up and comers who are serving volley. The way that kind of the... Zverev is a bit of a serving volley. You're a long, lanky guy from Germany. Okay. He's uh, doing a little bit of that? Yeah, a little bit. He needs to improve on it. I think there's a big space for a, kind of the, the return of your Patrick Rafter, Pete or Sanford. McEnroe, Pete Sanford, somebody who's coming in, chipping, charging. 
Federer Taking hasn't been in that game, but I mean, as with age, he has had to play more along the baseline. Yeah, Federer is a great. You know, and it's also interesting to think that kind of back in the day too. And this is still the case in some of the on the women's side. Mm -hmm. uh, that used to have all the top players would also play doubles in the tournament. Yeah, what's up with that? I mean, kind it's, of, it's now just the Bryan brothers, or now he's playing with Jack Sock, one of the Bryan brothers. Yeah, 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 yeah. But even the the guys would win both the singles and the doubles Intense. in the same tournament. You know, it, it's pretty incredible. So yeah. I think the. For whatever reason, I think the, the, the rackets and the the power of, of kind of serves today, uh -huh. and the ground strokes, I think it's, it's made it tougher for people to get to net and take yeah, it over, but I course. think there's there's a big space for that to that to revive itself. Interesting. So do you think, I mean, within men's tennis, uh, do you think Djokovic will ever eclipse Feder? No, I think Fed, I think Fed's gonna, fourteen and twenty majors respectively. I I, I don't think we're gonna end uh, on on twenty for Federer. I think I, I think he's got one more one I think Djokovic eclipses him. Interesting. In terms of numbers, okay. I don't think he'll ever be considered the goat. Federer's the goat. I think Federer's the goat, and I think uh, Djokovic. I, I think will I think win Serena, more majors. I think Serena's got that locked down on the on the women's side. No as doubt, well. no doubt. Um, but I think I think Djokovic, dude, he's come back from that injury and won, you know, the U.S. and, and Wimbledon, right? Or was it Aussie? And yeah, that? he won Wimbledon. Yeah, the U.S. Dude, and Wimbledon, I think, back yeah, to back. Exactly. I mean, and he beat a tough uh, Kevin Anderson yeah. in the U.S. And then uh, I forgot who he played in the Wimbledon final. but And he's, uh, I, I, Djokovic has still got a great, he's got a great personality. Stunned. He's a... Uh, uh, I think he's revved up Serbia and Eastern Europe. He's got, a, he's got actually, he even started opening, I think, a, a handful of, of, uh, of restaurants back in Serbia, yeah, which yeah. Are, may make a <clears throat> make their way to the U.S. at some point. Yeah. So, well, interesting thing about him and Murray, Murray and Djokovic is a crazy rivalry. Um, it's the only rivalry in the Open era where the two have met in the four majors, nine Masters, tour finals, and the Olympics. Wow. The only that's, rivalry. Yeah, uh, that's unknown. I think Murray, Murray though, I think injury prone. Man. Yeah, we just haven't seen him for a while, so I think that even kind of the. Uh, He's such a power player too that injuries really affect his game. Yeah. I mean, uh, so why does it seem that there's a little bit more parity within women's tennis as, as to men's tennis? Like, I'm, if I, I'm serious, like if I see anyone outside of those big four, Fed, Joker, uh, Nadal, or Murray winning a tournament, I'm like, Wawrinka. And I know Stan Wawrinka, he's a great player. Stan the man, he's Swiss, he's won the U Australian Open. But if I see him winning, or if I see like Isner in a final, or Kevin Anderson, I'm like, what the heck happened? Where What happened to one of the big four? Whereas women's tennis, I mean, yes, Serena and her sister have dominated it at times, but whether it's injury or whether it's layoff for having a kid, there's been more parity with Halep, Wawrinka, Azarenka, Coco Vandaway. Yeah. I mean, being kind of top women's players. Does that have to do with the serve? Or? Uh, no, I mean, I think there's uh, maybe uh, on the men's side, kind of the, the those big four, if you want to call them that, that, I think are just kind of a little bit of a league above the rest They're of the so field. Good. And it have been that way. And are slowing down a little bit, maybe, um, but I think had been uh, just a touch above. Um, but I think, I think it's on that the, they all have each other to compete with, too. It makes them better. That could be, too. That could be, too. Uh, the... Uh, uh, I mean, you had kind of Agassi and Sampras and uh -huh. they kind of growing up, you know, a, a different era where I Bjorg think those players, Magno. exactly, were kind of at, at a slightly different level. I think on the women's side, you have Serena, who I think is at a slightly different level. When she's in, she's kind of a perennial favorite. You yeah, know? no doubt. If she's playing and then after her, I think it's it's a much wider open space. Yeah. Um, and I think on the women's side, too, you have you have some exciting younger female players, too, like Sloan Stevens, who, who are really emerging as... as, as Kind of She's a stud. And Naomi Osaka. Naomi Osaka, exactly. <clears throat> um, so I think there's going to be, I, th there's some good personalities as well on the women's side. And yeah. uh, I think it's going to be, uh, uh, I think Serena's got a, a, at least a couple more left. But it'll be a, a really interesting to see who kind of steps into that into that space yeah absolutely um, down the road just if i mean just to finish it off with tennis i do want to give full credit to naomi osaka because i thought serena's behavior in that final was not very appropriate and you know uh the commentators kind of made a meal out of it and naomi osaka got booed when she won the trophy she had to put her visor out in front of her head just want to give her a big shout out yeah. she dominated I, that match no i think, Ser I think serena did, did the right thing after the uh during the trophy ceremony, when she got booed, I think she kind of gave a. Uh, she did, yeah. She, you know, I think she put her arm around uh, Osaka, and I think it kind of carried herself with her, recognized that, yeah. you know, kind of that she deserved, me. exactly. Uh, and Osaka deserved kind of some real credit for not only winning 
the U.S. Open, but I think she also she's won 21. the Indian Wells yeah. tournament and, and, and kind of cleaned the field. Yeah, she's a stud. A, a few weeks beforehand, so I think she's really emerged as a as a legit player. And as a tennis former tennis player yourself and myself. That chair umpire did not do anything wrong. He was within the rules to punish Serena the way he did. I think no. I I, I think he was within the rules to uh, to to give those warnings and to uh, to make those calls. But I think that the challenge was that they. I think, and I think it's probably accurate that there is a. a some of the same standards in terms of warnings are not applied to the. I mean, you can look at Macro clips. It's, the, it's it's fair. That's fair. But so so I think that that was. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that that is what the narrative was after kind of a really well played, well won tournament. Oh yeah, she for handily Osaka. won the first set, and she was up four three before any of that happened in the second set, and she broke serve in the second set. Also, we have to, it has to be noted though, in two thousand nine, Serena Williams was kicked out of the U.S. Open for yelling at a ball person on the sideline. I'll shove the ball down your fucking throat. Those were her quotes. And she got kicked out of the 2009 US Open. So she does have a bit of a history there of... Yeah, but I think I think, I think think people emerge. I mean, the other interesting thing about kind of... Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Roger Federer, who now is, I think, the uh, probably the most even-keeled... He's Swiss. <laughs> but he, 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 in juniors, got kicked out of numerous tournaments for horrific behavior racket... Really? Cracks on the court and was able to find a way. He was kind of one of the top uh, world juniors as well. Wow. And he was known for having just a loose temper. So I think you can kind of also... I didn't know that at all. ...change some of that stuff kind of... You you learn to kind of lock it in and uh, that kind of... Especially in a game like tennis. Wow. That kind of your temper getting away from you can lead to kind of your, your level point. of play dropping. Fair point, fair point. And sometimes your temper maybe fires you up. There's players who like to yeah, play angry. Like absolutely. I think Kyrgios, Kyrgios, absolutely. he loves to play angry. Absolutely. All right, man, so that's about it for the subjects. We broke it down pretty heavy. Uh, I got 10 quick fire questions for you that I'm just going to round off real Let's fast. Do it. Look, there's no time limit. You get no points. You get no prize at the end. It's worth nothing. Folks, let's start the clock. All right. So, Federer and Nadal. Federer. Favorite character from TV. As long as it's not on clay. Ah, there you go. The caveat. <laughs> favorite character from TV. Who? Favorite character from TV. Yep. All the time. Could be any, from any show. Cartoon, movie. Or not movie, obviously, but anything. Oh, man. I'd probably say... Uh, probably Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. Mr. Burns. I love it. Least favorite beverage. Ooh. Probably <laughs> Yoo-Hoo, I think. Which oh, I, man. I had some... Uh, <laughs> Some bad experiences with. There has to be a story behind up. that. Too bad it's quick fire. Mornings, <laughs> afternoons, or nights? Mornings. Morning guy. Nike, Adidas, Puma, or other? Nike. Nike man. So if aliens exist, this is saying they do exist, are they smarter or dumber than us? Dumber. They're dumber. All right. What was your favorite cartoon show growing up? Mm, definitely uh, definitely Looney Tunes and probably that big... Uh, uh, that big purple monster. I forget that guy's name. <laughs> I don't remember. We'll have to look that up for you folks. <laughs> All right. What's your least favorite type of music? Hard charging EDM. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you're stranded on a tropical island, right? You're stranded on a tropical island. You have one restaurant to get all you can eat food from. What restaurant are you picking? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a tough I'd one. I'd probably pick... One of the fabulous Bay Area dim sum restaurants. Uh huh. Maybe uh, maybe Yang Sing. Yang Sing. And their uh, shrimp dumplings. I think it's just a huge <laughs> plate of large uh, jumbo shrimp dumplings. Just the Ebby fillet on deck. <laughs> All right. So, final one: Mel Brooks or Larry David? Mel Brooks. But Mel also Brooks. with a shout out to uh, Three Amigos. Hot shots, naked gun, and some of the other other uh, comedic greats. Absolutely, and I got one bonus question for him. Rank the four majors in tennis in terms of importance. So, however you want to start, least or most important. What do you want? Let's to start, start least. Let's start. So, least. starting so with the least, least important. I think we can all agree least is probably. I'm sorry for no any disrespect, Australian viewers, but I think the Australian Open is probably the least. I would have to say that's objective. Objectively, is Melbourne I think is supposed to be a beautiful city, but amazing. I, I think I've been that, there. I don't think the tournament is is, is quite comes as just relative high. to the other ones. Uh, second least, I think I'd have to give it to Rolling Garros. It, yeah, I think the at least for kind of an American watching, I 
have a, we have a little bit more trouble watching on clay. Of course. Uh, I think the uh, I have been the Roland Garros. The the atmosphere is is great, but it's it's not quite uh, the U.S. Open. Or it's not Arthur Ashe under the lights. Three would have to be, or the the runner up I think would have to be uh, the U.S. The US. Open. Yep. I think they do. It's an amazing uh, experience. They have the. Uh, uh, the famous drink, the honey deuce. <laughs> what's, the, what's the honey deuce? What's honey the honey deuce? They drink with. Uh, they they <laughs> cap it off with two kind of scoops of, of honeydew melon. No. That uh, look like the kind of uh, like two tennis balls. It's pretty. That that's the it's amazing. It's their it's their strawberries it, and cream. It rivals. That's their pimps cup. I think. That's yeah, their pimps yeah, cup. Yeah. I should say. Yeah. Uh, and then well, that inevitably leads to our top. And top time. hands down. Wimbledon, I think it's the... Uh, the mystique of it. The mystique, the environment, people get dressed up, strawberries and cream, Pim's Cup, uh, the gold trophy, uh, the grass. The royal family watching. The royal family, <laughs> even though we, we don't really... We're still not too big on, uh, on royalty in this country. You exactly. Know? We, did, we have a revolution with uh, <laughs> with uh, because of uh, no taxation without representation. Exactly. Um, but it's, it's an incredible tournament. Yeah. Now, I also will say that you, when you think about kind of center court, only being an intimate environment of about 10,000, 11,000 seats yeah, I didn't versus know Arthur that. Ashe being about 45,000. I mean, every seat's a good seat. Every 10, seat's 000. a good seat. Yeah. That's, so. And it's only an hour away from London, which is, you know, fabulous. Good point. Yeah, well, there it is. You know, th guys, thank you so much for tuning into the Oddcast. Again, shout outs to you and yours. Whenever you're watching, thank you so much for taking the time and tuning in to the Oddcast where stuff that's odd gets the nod. You've heard it here first from my main man, Andy Rabins. MT, thank you for having me, man. And to the viewers, thank you guys for watching. And I'm excited to see what, uh, where, where, where the podcast goes. And he will be back, my friends. So thanks for tuning in. Andy. Awesome. Thanks. Appreciate thanks. you, man. Let's get a little weird. Let's get a little odd. Those sounds you like to hear. We got it going on. It's the Oddcast. It's the Oddcast. It's the Oddcast. It's the Oddcast.